Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I've been waiting for you. Welcome to the world of suspense, imagination. A world where nothing is impossible and everything is foolproof. At least that's what Peter Vincent thought, the hero of our tale. Peter Vincent is approaching middle age. Not quite there, but already beginning to experience the disillusions, the restlessness that comes from feeling we're capable of better things and fearing time will run out before we achieve them. But Peter Vincent, who lives by his wit, his charm, his cunning, hit one day on a scheme that appeared to be his great triumph. <laughs> mystery drama, Dressed to Kill, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Robert Morse. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And Peter Vincent is about to weave a tangled web of deception the likes of which he has never tried before and hopes never to have to try again. Our story begins in a cheap but clean and well-run apartment house on New York City's west side. Oh, uh, Mr. Vincent. Yes, Mrs. Gretsch. It's the fifth of the month. Well, thank you, Mrs. Gretsch. Uh, do you tell the time, too? Look, I'll thank you not to be so smart when you're late with the rent. Two months late at that. Only two months this time. Things are looking up for you. I got my bills to pay, too, you know. And everything going up. Everything goes up around here except the heat. I've been meaning to speak to you about that. There is an energy crisis. I have to conserve all You'll the... have your own crisis if I catch pneumonia and can't work. I shall sue you, Mrs. Gretsch, for depriving me of my livelihood. Uh, I'd like to know just what that is. You know what I do. Well, you, you call yourself an actor. Act is act. You haven't been in a show since you started living here. Does that make me any the less an actor? We are all acting, Mrs. Gretsch. You, I, everyone. We're playing out our roles on this great stage. We are never really ourselves. We hide behind the masks and we act out our little lives. I mean, you're acting. You don't want to press me for the rent, but you must. It's your role in life. So you step up on the stage as you are now, the star of this, this mini-drama, acting the part of the miserable, harassed landlady insisting on the rent. And you do your part extraordinarily well. Have you ever thought of going on the stage? Ah, well, <laughs> my sister was always telling me I, I had a nice voice. And she's right, she is. <laughs> I may speak to my agent <laughs> about you, yes. Yeah. I might just be able to get you yeah, a but, part... Yeah, uh, but get me the rent instead. Beautiful, Mrs. Gretsch, that was beautiful. You have a natural sense of timing. You'll make a wonderful heroine someday. You're past the ingenue roles, but still... You have till the 10th, Mr. Vincent, not a day after. That's it, Mrs. Gretsch. Keep studying. Stupid old frump. Hi, Pete. Murray, what are you doing here? Drinking your scotch. I thought you were in Cleveland. Ah, oh, the show folded. Oh, how'd you get in? You gave me a key a year ago, remember? Well, remind me to change the lock. I'm sick of your freeloading, Murray. Look, just a couple of days till I get settled. I gave up my room when I went on the road. You're not staying here. Oh, come on, Pete. I'll pay half the rent. Well, welcome home, Murray. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking pretty good, Pete. You been eating regularly? Off and on. I pulled a little flim-flam job a few months ago. Paid the back rent. What about acting? Any leads? No, but I'm working on something, Murray. Something really big. I'm sick of those ratty little deals for peanuts. Oh, come on. Not another con game. The greatest, Murray. The one that'll set me up for life on that sunny little beach in Mexico. I'm going to pull one last gigantic hoax and then retire. I mean, just settle down for life. I've been thinking about it for months. Great. What's the scheme? I'm going to kill myself. Well, that's one way to... You what? I'm going to kill myself. But it won't be suicide. 
You're going to kill yourself, but it won't be suicide. That's right, Murray. And my wife will receive $50,000 in insurance. Now, I know you're nuts. I'm serious, Murray. How can you be? You may go ahead and kill yourself, but your wife isn't going to get any 50 grand. You're not even married. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to have another martini while I try to focus in on this. It has to work, Murray. It's foolproof. Nothing is foolproof. I've been looking at it from every angle, and the more I look, the more I'm convinced it's going to work. Now, Peter Vincent will die. His wife will disappear forever, and I'll come out of the whole thing with $50,000. Let, let me get this straight. You're going to fake your own debt and then impersonate your wife to collect the insurance? Precisely. I've got a $25,000 double indemnity policy. I've had it for years. I got it back in the better days when I was working regularly and traveling a lot. My mother was a beneficiary. But after she died, I just never did anything about changing the policy. I kept it up. You're not only out of work, you're out of your mind. No, listen, Murray, when I thought of this thing last year, I went and changed the beneficiary on that policy. I made up a name, Tina Vincent. The beneficiary is Tina Vincent, wife of the deceased. I've just been waiting, letting enough time go by so it looks legitimate. Well, it's a blockbuster, all right. If you get away with it, there are a lot of things to consider. How are you going to pass for a woman? The impersonation is the main... Yeah, that's it. Can you be convincing? When I put my mind to something, I can be very convincing. I don't believe it. Where did you learn to talk like that? I used that voice in a nightclub act a couple of years ago. Well, it's perfect. It's a perfect day. S say something else. <laughs> it was sweet of you to invite me to dinner, Murray. <laughs> oh, Murray, pay the check and let's just get out of here. Fantastic. Well, the first thing to do now is create, you know, Tina Vincent. Now, will you help me, Murray? Hey, give me that voice again. That really spooks me hearing that dame's voice coming out of you. Well, that's because you haven't seen me at my best, Murray. Wait till I'm dressed for the part. <laughs> May I help you, sir? Oh, yes. Uh, I was interested in these pants suits. Oh, well, these are on sale today. I is it a, a gift for your wife, perhaps? Yes, you might. Uh, yes, you might say that. For my wife, yes. Oh, well, how nice. Oh, uh, uh, what's her size? A size? Oh, uh, about, uh, like mine. Like yours? Oh, uh, rather tall, then. Huh? Decidedly. Well, let me see. I, well, I'd say about an 18 tall. And if it doesn't fit, she can always bring it back. Fine. Now, now, the suits on this rack are all size 18. I'll take this blue and how about that black velvet. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> you uh, certainly know your wife's taste. Yes, I do, rather. All right, well, I'll have these boxed and gift wrapped. Will there be anything else, sir? Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, she's been wanting a new wig. Oh, yes, sir. Step this way. Next counter down. Now, what does she wear? Blonde, brunette? Black? Oh, dear me, yes. I, funny, I've never really noticed. Oh, well, uh, what's her coloring like? Fair? Dark? Fair, fair. Like, uh, like mine, almost. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, well, this frosted blonde would be perfect. Yeah. Oh, this one, yeah. Yes, yes, I think that would do. Oh, here, just for fun. You try it on. Huh? Oh, come on. <laughs> you say her coloring is like yours. No, please, that's silly. Oh, here, here, let me just slip it over your head. Ow. <laughs> Adjust it a little and... Uh. What? It's incredible, sir. What's incredible? Well, I don't know, but this wig, I... I, I <laughs> well, I, I hope you'll forgive me for saying so, but... What? With that wig on, you could pass for a rather attractive woman. Really? Yeah, except for one thing. And what's that? Well, your mustache. Well, Murray, how do I look? Like a tall Doris Day. Come on, <laughs> will you? Come on, what have I forgotten? Now, what's, what is wrong with this whole image? Nothing. I, I gotta admit, it's perfect. Yeah. Have I got on too much makeup? No, I don't think so. Lots of women go in for heavy makeup. Well, there's only one sure way to find out. The acid test. Go out in public. Precisely. Because I've got to be convincing as a woman before I've gone too far. Where are you going to start? Well, first I'm going to open a bank account. I've got to establish some sort of identity. 
14 of Vincent. Just impersonating a woman isn't good enough because when I get down to the final act, applying for the insurance, I've got to prove that I really am Tina Vincent. I've got to have identification. You sure have thought this thing out, Pete. I've been planning it for almost a year. Well, I'm going to start with the bank. Oh, lend me 50 bucks, will uh, you? No, I, I promise you, you'll get it back in spades when this whole thing's over. Yeah, when you're in Mexico, you mean. Come on, Murray, be a patron of the arts, huh? Where's your imagination? Now, come on, don't let a little thing like a few bucks keep us from carrying out one of the greatest schemes of all times. No wonder you don't have to work. Okay, here, you won't regret it. You want to come along and watch the fun? I wouldn't miss it for the world. I paid 50 bucks for that reserved seat. Stage fright? No. At this point, I have nothing to lose. Let's call it a first read-through. Okay, give me that Tina voice again. You gotta get a character. Good afternoon. I'd like to open a savings account. Perfect. <laughs> Is the wig straight? Yeah. Everything looks fine to me. Okay, Murray. All right. Uh, let's... All right. Here I go. I beg your pardon? Uh, oh, good afternoon, madam. May I help you? Yes. I'd like to open a savings account. Certainly. Um, sit down, please. Uh, will this be an individual or joint account? An individual. I'm starting to save a little for a surprise vacation for my husband in Mexico. <laughs> well, that's very nice, very nice. Uh, may I have your name, Mrs... Uh, Vincent. <laughs> Tina Vincent. All right, Mrs. Vincent, if you'll fill out both these cards. Name, address, uh, social security number. Social security number? I beg your pardon? Oh, <laughs> A little catch in the throat. <laughs> no, a social security number. No, I I don't have one. I, I mean, my card must be at home. I haven't worked for so many years. I see. Well, you can always uh, send that into us later. Oh, thank heavens. How much would you uh, like to deposit? Well, fifty dollars. Very well, Mrs. Vincent. <laughs> You should have seen his face when I dropped back to my own voice for that horrible second. Did, did he realize? I don't think so. He was startled, but I carried it off. I have to do better than that, though, when I face an insurance company. I've got to be totally convincing. Well, you just need more practice. You're right, Murray. I've got to try and live an entire week as Tina Vincent. Everywhere I go, everything I do will be Tina Vincent. Yeah, but I, I got my doubts, a lot of big doubts. Why? Well, maybe you can talk like a woman and dress up like one for a while. But I don't think you can keep up the pose. Sustain it, I mean. That's what I want to find out. And I've got a great idea. This will be the test to end all tests. If I can fool that hawk-eyed superintendent, Mrs. Gretch, the toughest insurance man, will be a pushover. Yeah, how are you going to do that? Another brilliant piece of business, Murray. I just hope I can keep from laughing in her face. Because I've got to fool her in order to live here this week as Tina Vincent. <laughs> in fact, she doesn't know it. But she's going to be an unwitting supporting player in our little drama. And I do mean supporting particularly if there should be an insurance investigation later. Yeah, and that's a very likely possibility. I've been wondering how you plan to stage your own death. That's Act Two, Murray. Now, let's establish the bereaved beneficiary first. But there's got to be a body. Yes, it is customary. Insurance companies don't pay out until they're sure the policyholder is dead. That's right, Murray. Then, as I see it, if you're going to get away with this thing, you've got to get away with murder. Indeed. Get away with murder. And get away with being a convincing Mrs. Tina Vincent. In order to get away with $50,000. A tall order for even the best actor or female impersonator. Particularly when someone else is in on the whole scheme. But first things first. Let's see how well Peter Vincent makes out spending a week as Mrs. Vincent's. When we return shortly with Act Two. Peter Vincent, con artist, 
sometime actor, is preparing what he considers the greatest scheme of his career, impersonating his own beneficiary, Mrs. Tina Vincent, to collect his own insurance. But first, he must prove to others and to himself he can carry out the impersonation. So, for the next few days, Peter Vincent will disappear, and Mrs. Tina Vincent will take over. Who is it? I'd like to see the superintendent. What do you want? I'm looking for a man named Peter Vincent. I was told he lives in this building. Well, his name's on the mailbox, 2A. But uh, I don't think he's in. I haven't seen him since yesterday. Oh, uh, uh, well, would you be kind enough then to let me into his apartment? Oh, certainly not. I don't know you. I'm Mrs. Vincent, his wife. Uh, his wife? Hey, I didn't know he was married. He... He's lived here two years. We're separated, but I'm still Mrs. Vincent. <laughs> oh, glory be. What next from that man? I know Mr. Vincent wouldn't mind your letting me in. He doesn't know I'm in town. I want to surprise him. Oh, I'm afraid not, Mrs. How do I know he'd be glad to see you? Look, if he wants you in his apartment, he'll be the one to let you in. Well, of all... Well, how'd it go? Smooth, Murray, smooth. The old crow didn't bat an eyelash. To her, I'm a perfect stranger. If he wants you in his apartment, he'll be the one to let you in. That's just what she said. Come on. We have to arrange for my wife's lodging. Uh, where now? Uh, that phone booth there. Lend me a dime, Murray. I've got to make a call. I'll put it on your bill. Consider it an investment. I told you, you'll share in the spoils. I hope you know what you're doing, because I sure don't. Another scene in our little drama, Murray. Hello? Uh, hello, Mrs. Gratch. This is Peter Vincent. Oh, Mr. Vincent, where are you? I'm out of town, Mrs. Gratch. I had an unexpected chance for a part, and I won't be back for at least a week. Would you keep an eye on my apartment for me? I've done that already. Uh, uh, there was a woman here not five minutes ago and uh, said she was your wife. Tina? Tina was there? Oh, that's what she called herself. Is she really your wife, Mr. Vincent? Yes, yes, we're separated. I haven't seen Tina for years. Oh, well, uh, she wanted me to let her into your apartment to surprise you, but I wouldn't do it. Oh, Mrs. Gretch, I wish you had. Why? Oh, you mean it's all right? Well, you wouldn't have had any way of knowing. Tina and I are the best of friends, Mrs. Gratch. Look, if she should come back, you know, if you see her again by any chance, please, please, let her in. In fact, she can stay there until I get back. Let her use my apartment, you know, if she likes. Well, all right, if you say so, Mr. Vincent. I hope you have a good run. A what? Oh. Just a little show talk I picked up. You did say you were a play. Oh, yes, yes. It's going to be a very uh, good run, Mrs. Gratch. In fact, it seems to be going beautifully. Oh, ju just a minute, sir. Uh, yes? Uh, I, I, I know you've been staying with Mr. Vincent, but now things have changed. Uh, he's out of town. Yeah, I know. And Mrs. Vincent is occupying the apartment. Tina? You mean Tina's here? And with Mr. Vincent away, I don't oh, think Oh, don't problem. worry, Mrs. Gretch. You didn't know. I'm Peter Vincent's brother-in-law. What? Yeah, Mrs. Vincent's my sister. Oh. Well, well, I, I hope uh, I hope she's not here to make trouble. Mr. Vincent said they were separate. Oh, don't worry. It's probably a reconciliation. They've always admired each other, even though they couldn't live together. Uh, I certainly hope so. Stupid old biddy. Uh, Tina... It's Murray. Murray, surprise! When did you get into town? Just today. Come in. <laughs> oh, good show, brother dear. You know, I'm beginning to enjoy this part. Yes, keep you in practice. And what's next for you? Us, Murray. We're going out on the town tonight. What? That's right. We're going to an east side bar, and here's what I want you to do. Another martini, Murray, please. 
Uh, bartender, a martini for the lady. And let's make this the last. Oh, Murray. Hey, you've been drinking too much, and you know it. Murray, please. Look, I know when you've had too many martinis. I don't know why I'm sap enough to keep ordering them for you. Murray, I am all right. You're the one. I'm the one. I'm as sober as a judge, and I can see what's happening to you. Murray, this is very... Murray, Murray, Murray. That's all I ever hear from you. I'm getting out of here. I'm sick of you whining and complaining. Goodbye. Murray! Hey, honey. What? He ain't coming back. What do you drink? I don't drink with strangers. I'm Harry Watson. How do you do? You see, now we're not strangers. No, I'm not interested. Ah, oh, come on. Good-looking dame like you. Man runs out on her. Come on, let's have a little fun. No, please, you don't understand. It's not like that at all. Oh, baby, I know all about what it's like. Believe me. And you're something. Oh, you, uh, you really think so? Baby, I know so. What's your name? Oh, well, I've... Tina. Uh, Tina what? Oh, uh, just Tina. Pretty name. Come on, let's have another drink and, uh, let's get acquainted. Well, all right, maybe just one. <laughs> hey, uh, a bartender, another... What are you drinking? Martini. Yeah, a martini. Right. Harry... Do you really think that I'm, uh, <laughs> attractive? Sure I do. Would I be buying you a martini if I didn't? You're not just feeling sorry for me. Nah, of course not. You're interesting. And I wouldn't be surprised if things got more interesting later. Oh, you'd be surprised, Harry. Would you ever be surprised? <laughs> And, and then what happened? I drank the martini and left. I proved my point. Tomorrow I'm going to apply for a social security number and keep on good terms with Mrs. Gretch. She's going to be important to us later on. Look, Pete, don't, don't you think you've carried the joke far enough? What do you mean? Look, you've proved you can be a convincing dame. It's been fun and funny. But you're not really serious about knocking some guy off and trying to make the insurance company think it's you. Of course I'm serious. I might add that I am dead serious. But that's murder. Not really. Not with what I have in mind. Now stop worrying so much. Just think about that $50,000, and it's a lot closer than you think. I don't have to prove myself anymore, Murray. I can carry off the masquerade. The time has come for Act Two. Act two? The victim. I have to find my corpse. We have to plan this carefully because when I leave here, I'll never return, you see, as Peter Vincent. And I want you to get a hotel room. Some sleazy, out-of-the-way place where we can get past the desk clerk without being seen. Whereabouts? Uh, near the Bowery, but not actually on it. Now, call me from there. I've got some preparations to make here because today, Peter Vincent meets with his accident. Hello? Uh, Pete? Where are you, Murray? The Hotel Matador, room 218. I'll find it. Now, I'll meet you there in about an hour. Drop off the necessary things, and then, Murray, we'll go shopping for a corpse. What a neighborhood. Perfect hunting ground. Yeah, if we get out alive. Uh, they're all too drunk to care about anything but where their next drink is coming from. Look, look at that creature there. Let's try him. You'll never get him on his feet. You. Hey, wake up. Wake up. How would you like to make ten dollars? What ten bucks? Enough to keep you in Muscatel for two weeks. Hey, where do you guys want? Huh? A little of your time. I don't know you. You will shortly, and all your troubles are going to be over. Oh, well, that's nice. Now, just come on, come on, come on. Come with us. We'll make you nice and comfortable. It is. Isn't he perfect, Murray? He's so disgustingly depraved. Yeah. Ten bucks for what? For doing us and yourself a favor. What's that? Just, just please, come with us. Take it, Murray. Take his arm. Take right. his arm. All right. All right. Let's get him to the hotel. Can you see anyone in the lobby? 
No, just, just the clerk at the desk. Do you think you can distract him? Well, what's the difference? This place is full of guys in this condition. I don't want any suspicions aroused. I want to get up to that room and out again without being seen. Hey, wait, wait a minute. The clerk's going toward the elevators. Hey, what's this all about? Shut up. He's gone up. All right, now. Come on, now, move. Let's take the stairs. It's only one flight up. I hope that clerk hasn't gone to the second floor. If we do meet anyone, just keep going. Well, I can't. You... Shut up and keep moving. All right, now, wait a second. I'll check the hall. Okay, stop it now. Okay. I'll run ahead and open the door. All right. I don't see how anyone who doesn't eat regularly could have so much weight. Well, we made it. All right, get him into that chair. Yeah. All right, now get the hot water going. My case has shaving cream, soap. I'll get these foul clothes off him. Phew. A second. Th Murray, I'll run the tub. You undress him. I'd never have believed it. All it took was a shave, some cleaning up, my best suit, and he looks like a human being. Uh, what's this all about? Uh, uh, what? Uh, it's just a joke on a friend. Now, look, here's a wallet. Now, lend uh, me a ten spot, will you, Murray? We did promise him. Now, here's your $10 in this wallet, see? Now, we'll just put it inside your coat like this, and you can keep the wallet, too, and the clothes. And there stands Peter Vincent. My clothes, all my identification, and heading for eternity. We'll wait till 5.15, the height of the subway rush hour. Looks like home. Move, <laughs> move to the rear of the platform, Murray. That way, when the train passes us, it'll be going full speed. Look, this is ridiculous, Pete. We got two hundred witnesses. Safety in numbers, Murray. We're lost in the crowd, and not one of them will know what's happened till it's all over. A man falls in front of a subway train. There'll be thirty different versions of what happened. We should have done this at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, then we would have witnesses. We stand out like a red nose. Edge a little closer. I want to lie down. You will very soon, Murray. Just before the train reaches the platform, let go of him. We both step back. When he totters and falls, we lose ourselves in the confusion. Isn't there an easier way? It has to be an accident to collect the double indemnity. And I don't want any body left to identify. Just the wallet and my identification. Here it comes. All right, a little closer to the edge. Now step back, Murray. Hey, what's the... Hey! 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 I'll meet you back at the hotel. Have another drink, Murray. You'll feel better. Oh, it seemed kind of cruel. He was standing too close to the track. He was unsteady on his feet. Yeah, we put him there. Look, will you forget him? That was Peter Vincent who went under the wheels of the train. If you want to feel remorse, just remember it's for your brother-in-law. Your dear sister's husband. All right, don't don't worry. I'll play along. Look, we're really in this for keeps, Murray. We have to go through with it all the way because Peter Vincent is dead. I can't ever be Peter Vincent again without admitting to murder. Well, what do we do now? Act three, brother dear. Tina's going to get dressed, go back to her husband's apartment, and wait to be told she's a widow. <laughs> Peter Vincent has certainly got himself into a tangled web. But that unabashed self-confidence of his has seen him through many a tight squeeze. Let's see if it carries him through this one final scheme. His greatest hopes, as he calls it, to set himself up for life. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Peter Vincent has been conveniently disposed of, to all intents and purposes, under the wheels of a speeding subway train. And now, Tina Vincent is back at the apartment, nervously awaiting the news of her husband's death. 
Hello? What's the word? I told you not to call me tonight. Well, I just want to know if anything's happened. No, no, nothing yet. Now, I'll be in touch with you. Stay at that hotel. Look, there's the door. I've got to go. Who is it? Police. Uh, police? What is it, officer? I'm Detective Sergeant David, ma'am. Is this the apartment of Peter Vincent? Why, yes, it is. You are Mrs. Vincent? Yes. There's been an accident, Mrs. Vincent. I'll uh, have to ask you to come down with us to headquarters. Wait, what is it? Has something happened to Peter? Yes, ma'am. Well, tell me. He, uh... He fell in front of a subway train at the Times Square station. I know this is painful for you, Mrs. Vincent. Yes. This is Peter's wallet, all right. The cigarette lighter I gave him for his birthday. And this is all that's left. Well, there's no use asking you to identify the body. Oh, what happened? Well, until we find a complete report, there's nothing official. The witness's stories differ. Mm. Now, all we know is that he fell in front of that train. Oh, we, we don't know how or why. Do you know where your husband was going? No, not really. He just said he was heading downtown. Did he often do that? I mean, go without telling you where he was going. Well, Peter had been drinking heavily for several days. Oh, well, that's important. It may have a strong bearing. Do you suppose he uh, passed out? Uh, we'll have to hold judgment on that, Mrs. Vincent. We, we may need more information from you. Yes, of course. Well, that's all for now. Uh, we'll get you back home, unless there's some other place you want to go. A friend's, perhaps? No, 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 thank you. I'll, I'll go back to the apartment. Call my brother to be with me. Stop worrying, Murray. You're absolutely in no danger. I'm the one with my neck yeah, out. Yes, suppose there is some way to identify that bum. Well, there isn't. The police told me that themselves. There wasn't enough left to identify. That's exactly what I wanted. Besides, it's been three days. Hold it, hold it. I've got to get in character. Hello? Mrs. Vincent? Sergeant David again. Yeah, Sergeant. We're closing the file on Mr. Vincent. Uh, several witnesses corroborated the fact that Mr. Vincent was unsteady on his feet. And the lab report showed a high level of alcohol in parts of the body. Death was accidental with uh, inebriation a contributing factor. I see. If you'll come down to headquarters and sign a few papers, we'll release the remains for burial. And you'll receive the death certificate. You'll need that for any insurance Mr. Vincent may have had. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll be there this afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. Vincent. And I'm sorry. Case closed. Witnesses said he was unsteady on his feet. Death was accidental, etc., etc., etc. Hey, we have to arrange for my burial, Murray. We've got to go all the way to keep up appearances. But, hey, look, Murray, do me a favor. Make it simple, Murray. A simple burial. I really would have wanted it that way. <laughs> Yes, who is it? I'm from the Independent Insurance Company. I'm looking for Mrs. Tina Vincent. Oh, just a minute. I'm Mrs. Vincent. May I come in? Yes, certainly. Richard Stevens, Mrs. Vincent, my card. First, I want to offer my sympathy. Thank you. I know these times are hard to live through, but the living must go on living. Yes, Mrs. Vincent, you made a claim on your husband's policy with our company. Term life policy number H220982500, double indemnity. Yes, is anything wrong? Oh no. The death certificate was in order, premiums were up to date. I'd uh, just like to ask a few questions if you don't mind. I'm afraid that I just I don't understand. Well, you see, Mrs. Vincent, in accidents of this kind, we just want to rule out certain exigencies. Well, if you have any questions about my husband's death, uh, I'm sure you'll find the answers in the police report. Not all of them. Was your husband given to uh, heavy drinking, Mrs. Vincent? Mr. Vincent drank at times, yes. Was he disturbed about anything in particular? 
Mr. Stevens, if you're trying to suggest my husband's death was a suicide, you are very mistaken. Well, we always try to get to the bottom of accident cases when there's double indemnity involved. But um, I think you have a legitimate claim. Hmm. There's no further problem, then? I don't think so. I'll be running along. When can I expect the check? Well, we'll have it out to you before the end of the week. Good day, Mrs. Vincent. Goodbye. Oh, oh, excuse me, E. You've been to see Mrs. Vincent. Uh, are you a doctor? No. Oh. Oh, well, uh, I'm Mrs. Gretsch, the superintendent. Uh, how is she? Uh, she seems to have held up well so far, poor thing. Oh, well, she seems well. Uh, how long have the Vincents lived here, Mrs. Gretsch? Uh, and who, who are you to be asking? I'm investigating her insurance claim. Oh. Well, uh, if it'll help Mrs. Vincent get what's coming to her, I'll be glad to help, too. I, I, I guess it won't hurt to answer your questions. Was Mr. Vincent a heavy drinker? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I don't snoop into the tenant's business. How about Mrs. Vincent? Well, I, I don't know much about her. She only just got here. What do you mean? Oh, well, you see, they, they've been separated. She only arrived here a week ago for a reconciliation, her brother said. Her brother? Yeah, yeah. He, he and Mr. Vincent are good friends. I see. Well, thank you, Mrs. Gretsch. You've been very helpful. Calm down, Dick. Hank, I just know this dame and her brother did that Vincent guy in for the insurance. It all adds up. They were separated. All of a sudden, she shows up on the scene. Boom, he's dead and she's 50 grand richer. Where's your proof? I haven't got any. But I'm going to do a little checking on Mrs. Vincent. The guy's death was accidental. Now, how can you prove she had anything to do with it? That's what I'm paid to find out. This is the first time I've seen you lose your cool. I'm sick of hanging around like this, but I don't dare let down the masquerade. I want to get that money and get out of here. <sighs> Maybe you should have gone down to the insurance company. Shh. Yes? Uh, who is it? Richard Stevens from Independent Insurance. Uh, just a minute. Come in. Thank you. Uh, this is my brother, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Stevens. How do you do? How do you do? I'm, uh... Sorry for the delay, Mrs. Vincent, but as I said, we have to be careful. When can I expect the money, Mr. Stevens? Well, in the next mail. Now, if you'll just sign this form... Oh, um, very well. Anything to get this over with. I'll sign here and here. I hope this is the end of it. So do I. Oh, my pen, please. Oh, <laughs> yes. I hope I haven't inconvenienced you, but uh, you do understand. My sister's been under a great strain, Mr. Stevens. Yes, I imagine she has. Well, good day and good luck. There's something in his manner I don't like. He's paid to be suspicious. Well, he's sure earning his money. Murray! Here it is, the check, $50,000. I don't believe it. Mexico, here I come. Murray, I'm on my way to the bank. Make me a plane reservation for Acapulco. And I'll be right back to give you your split. And then I'm splitting for Sonny Mayo. Uh, we're going to the bank. What's the, you don't trust me, eh? Not at this point in time, no. You know, you are totally unprincipled, Murray. Uh, but what would I have done without you? Come on, I'm not even packing. You're welcome to the apartment, the furniture, and Mrs. Gretsch. Thanks. Now, now for my final performance. Uh, there you are, Mrs. Vincent. Fifty thousand in fifties and hundreds. And I can't tell you how sorry I am about your husband. You were saving for a vacation, weren't you? Yes, I'm surprised that you remember. Well, again, my sympathy... And good luck. Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Vincent. Oh, Mr. Stevens. Did you cash the check, Mrs. Vincent? Why, yes. Okay, Hank. You're under arrest. What is this? We'll talk about it at headquarters. You're under arrest for suspicion of fraud and murder. 
You can drop the pose now, Mrs. Vincent. This is preposterous. Yes, it is. And so is this. But stop my hair. Your wig, Mr. Vincent. And my compliments. You're a most convincing actor. I was afraid of this. How did you know? We were ready to pay the claim until I learned that your wife had just arrived in town. Mrs. Gretch. Yeah, some support. I thought Mrs. Vincent and her so-called brother here had to kill you for the insurance. So I decided to do some checking up on Mrs. Vincent. I needed her fingerprints, and I got them from the pen she, or uh, rather you, signed these forms with. Remember? Yes. Now it happens that in checking out the deceased Mr. Vincent, I learned he applied for a passport some years back. I had his fingerprints, too. And what do you think I discovered? I can hardly guess. That the prints on both Mr. Peter Vincent and Mrs. Tina Vincent were identical. How extraordinary. So I knew what your hoax was, Mr. Vincent. Because no matter how much a man and wife share in a marriage, they can never share the same fingerprints. Peter Vincent's greatest hoax indeed proved to be his last. It's too bad he cashed that insurance check, because until then, it was really only attempted fraud. But then I wonder if that isn't exactly what the insurance man wanted him to do. And, uh, of course, there was murder to answer for. If there is a lesson here somewhere, I suppose it's always be yourself. Unless, of course, you know where to pick up an extra set of fingerprints. I'll be back shortly. All the world's a stage. And we men and women, merely players. Sometimes we have our choice of roles. Sometimes the role is forced upon us. Peter Vincent chose his role, and if you'll pardon the expression, it was curtains for him. Our cast included Robert Morse, Michael Tolan, Bryna Rayburn, Dan Ocko, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? Secretary of State Kissinger is back home, sounding optimistic and not stopping after his marathon mission in the Middle East. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Kissinger arrived back in Washington just over an hour ago, sounding pleased with his success in getting a troop pullback agreement between Israel and Syria. Bernard Kalb reports. Back in Washington, finally, after 33 days of shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East, Secretary of State Kissinger... Walking off his plane at Andrews Air Force Base shortly before 2 a.m. Eastern Time with an assessment of the mission that brought a troop disengagement between Israel and Syria. We all take some pride in the fact that it was the United States that could play the role of mediator. And that it was the United States which was trusted by both sides to interpret the views of each side to the other it with fairness. Kissinger has time only for an act, then a busy day ahead of him explaining the disengagement agreement in person. According to the schedule, first to the president at 9 a.m., then a White House meeting with the congressional leadership, then a midday conference with U.N. Secretary General Kurt Waldheim, and in mid-afternoon behind closed doors with members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Bernard Kalb, CBS News, Andrews Air Force Base. 
The agreement Kissinger helped work out is to be signed in Geneva at ceremony starting three hours from now. Syrian and Israeli military officers will sign it. The House Judiciary Committee has a meeting scheduled for Friday to discuss whether it should make public all of the Watergate evidence it has gathered so far. Thursday, the committee voted to subpoena 45 more presidential conversations for its impeachment inquiry. The committee also sent President Nixon a letter saying his refusal to comply with its subpoenas could be grounds for impeachment. Presidential lawyer James St. Clair says Mr. Nixon will continue to withhold subpoenaed evidence in the Ellsberg break-in case, even if it means criminal charges against two former Nixon aides will be dropped. Involved are charges against John Ehrlichman and Charles Colson. The president, according to St. Clair, does not want the charges thrown out without a full and fair trial, but will not turn over evidence he judges vital to national security. The Baltimore Sun reports that former Vice President Spiro Agnew has paid his back taxes to the Internal Revenue Service, including interest and penalties. The paper said it could not determine just how much money Agnew paid. Agnew resigned as Vice President last October after pleading no contest to a tax evasion charge. In New York Thursday night, a spokesman for Pan American World Airways said the company paid about $50,000 to crime syndicate figures for the return of 2,000 black airline tickets stolen from Pan Am. The spokesman says stolen tickets have cost the company losses running into the millions of dollars. Pan Am says it bought back the stolen tickets with the knowledge of authorities and with their approval in hopes it could result in the arrests of leaders of the stolen ticket ring. The man considered to be the dean of American newspaper publishers died late Thursday night in Oklahoma City. That is Edward King Gaylord, who was 101 years old. Up until recent weeks, Gaylord had been working regularly. A family spokesman says he apparently suffered a heart attack. Gaylord was the editor and publisher of the Daily Oklahoman and the Oklahoma City Times. This is Doug Poling, CBS News.